Radio. Reconciliation, healing for a broken world. A talk by Owen Viner. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Order of Malta, my topic tonight is the question, how does the Sacrament of Reconciliation bring healing to our world? Such a topic is pertinent for two reasons. First, the season of Lent is almost upon us, and this is a time when many Catholics will receive the sacrament. Next Wednesday, we will hear St. Paul imploring us to be reconciled to God. Secondly, the pertinence of this topic is also related to the situation of our world today. Our world is broken. And the role of the church is to continue Jesus' ministry of healing to heal these wounds. To this end, Pope Francis uses what has now become his famous image of the church as a hospital. He said, I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal the wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. The church is a place for healing, and the sacraments are the medicine that the church administers to bring about this healing. The sacrament of reconciliation in particular is where patients are triaged, in this hospital, and as such it is critical that we properly diagnose whatever wound the person has who has come into the sacrament. So the first part of my talk tonight will involve an attempt to diagnose the source of our brokenness. And then in the second, I will discuss the sacrament itself as a personal encounter with the mercy of the Father that brings about our healing. So what is brokenness? The parable of the prodigal son provides us with an insight into the nature of our ailments. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, The younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the ponds, on the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and make merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to make merry. Now his eldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, 
because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your living of harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I think from this beautiful story we can see three particular ways in which we are broken. That is, the interior, the interpersonal, and cosmic brokenness. Brokenness affects us all differently. There are various addictions, broken relationships, psychological wounds. I do not want to speak about our woundedness on that level, important though as it is. Rather, I would like to discuss the deeper levels of brokenness that cause them. Addiction, loneliness, depression are symptoms of a more profound woundedness in our culture. The parable of the prodigal son provides us with insight into the nature of this more basic level of woundedness. We see in our culture a kind of restlessness. People do not want to be still, and we certainly don't want to be quiet and alone with our thoughts. We need to be plugged into something or looking at a screen. We need to be distracted. I believe that the source of this restlessness is an insatiability of the human heart. Human desire is infinite. It is never-ending. We have a long list of wants, and even when these wants are satisfied, we still desire more. There is always something else that is attracting my desire. It can be a person, a material object, it could be prestige and public recognition. It could be a sensation such as pleasure. But whatever it is, we always desire more. Because we have this infinite desire, we are faced with a particular danger when we try satiating it with merely finite goods. When we do this, we remain deeply dissatisfied in our hearts. There is a kind of restlessness, a disquiet, an unease, or perhaps even a dis-ease in our hearts. However, we think that if we stay long enough distracted, that we might just not notice the aches in our hearts, this dis-ease. Let us look at the prodigal son to shed light on this experience. His desire is such that he takes everything that he has and eventually squanders it in loose living. But what is it exactly that he is squandering? Certainly he loses his material possessions, but there is something far deeper. He finds himself in a far country, separated from his father. He longs to be fed on the food that the pigs are eating, and this would be the worst humiliation for Jesus' listeners. In his heart, he knows that he has betrayed his father and therefore no longer worthy to be his father's son. He has not merely squandered his wealth, he has squandered his very self. It is his being, his identity as son, that is lost. I think that this pervasive sense of being lost, this kind of existential directionlessness that afflicts us, is the first level of personal brokenness that we see in our culture. At the core of our being, we know that we are missing something, and we need to fill it in the end, but nothing satisfies. The second level of brokenness of which this parable speaks is an interpersonal division. We see this particularly in the son's separation from his father, 
but also in the division between the brothers. We see the anger of the elder brother. He hears from the servants that his brother has returned, but his heart hardens and he refuses to celebrate. There appears to be a a pervasive hardness of heart in our culture, and not just to strangers, also to those with whom we disagree, and even those closest to us. This hardness of heart towards the other leaves us divided and separated from those around us, including those within our own homes. Secondly, we also see that the brother will not acknowledge the humanity of the younger brother and his relationship. When the father announces to him that his brother has returned and is safe and sound, note the elder brother's response. He says, but when this son of yours came, he refuses to recognize the prodigal son as his own brother. Thus, this parable reveals that the fruit of our disconnectedness from each other is a depersonalization that takes place. We don't see each other as persons with an innate dignity and worthy of love and respect. Instead, we refuse to acknowledge the other's identity and our relatedness to the other. The other is no longer my brother or sister, rather, they are a stranger to me. And that is the second level of brokenness. And then finally, this parable speaks indirectly of a type of cosmic brokenness. The land is in famine, and the sun has strayed to a far country. I think that this points to two differing views of the world and our place in it. On the one hand, we see the world as raw material created for our exploitation. On the other, we think that we do not belong in the world, that we are somehow aliens or a parasite, and the world would be better off without us. We are strangers in a seemingly random universe. So to sum up, the parable points to our brokenness on a number of levels. This brokenness, I think, can be defined as a profound alienation that has taken place in the first place in our hearts, that is on the personal level and in terms of our identity. We begin, we begin to believe all of the falsehoods about ourselves and the meaninglessness of existence. We are also alienated from each other, that is, relationally. And then lastly, we are alienated from our world. Now, we can take our analysis one step further because I believe that the source of this alienation is even more foundational. There is a prior alienation and that is our separation from God. I think that an all-pervasive forgetfulness of God has seeped into our culture. The aggressive secularization of our culture has led to a type of amnesia. We find ourselves in the, in the far country of which the parable of the prodigal son speaks. Although, whereas the prodigal son never forgot that he is the father's son, that he belongs to him. We have forgotten our being from and our being for God. We are made for relationship with God. We come from God and we are created for God. To have forgotten this or to live as though this were not true leaves us lost and directionless. We do not know where we come from or where we are going. The image of being lost is one that Jesus himself uses in his parables and teaching. Our being made for God also explains our infinite desire that can never be satiated by merely finite things. We are made for a personal God who is a communion of persons. At the core of our existence lies the desire for relationships and communion and that alone will satisfy our hearts. When we become alienated from God, for whom we are made, we are wounded existentially, in the very core of our being, and we become alienated from ourselves, from others, and from the world. So now I'm going to look at the healing that the sacrament brings about to this woundedness. And I have to admit that it was a little depressing writing this first part of my talk 
and I felt the need every so often to step out into the sun and to get a break from it, but in Melbourne that can prove to be a problem. So, part two, reconciliation and healing. In the sacrament, we come to Christ present in the priest. We confess our sins and receive absolution for them, and we receive a penance, which is our effort to amend, uh, make amends for our sins. And that is what is taking place on the external level. But something far deeper is happening. The sacrament of reconciliation is a personal encounter with the Father of mercies, with the Son who has reconciled the world to the Father, and with the Holy Spirit who has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Now when I say we encounter God personally, I do not mean merely individualistically or privately. The word person has a rich history and etymology. I use the word to mean that we encounter God in our uniqueness. It is our whole selves, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our interior freedom, our relationships. All of this is in play when we encounter God. And this personal encounter with God is mediated by the church. So in this part, I would like to talk about mercy and how we encounter mercy personally in the sacrament. So in the sacrament, we hear that reconciliation is an act of mercy that comes from the Father. What is mercy? In, the light, in light of the pontificate of Francis, we see mercy being spoken about a great deal. For example, one commentator has labelled him the Pope of Mercy. Others have spoken of the fact that the Pope is now emphasising mercy over doctrine. I do not want to engage in a discussion on the media's betrayal of Francis. But what I would like to do is point out that long before Francis became Pope, John Paul II had an encyclical on mercy and was also called the Pope of Mercy. And Benedict XVI also spoke a great deal about mercy during his pontificate. I'd like to make four points regarding mercy. First, the word mercy comes from the Latin word misericordia. To be merciful towards another is to have a miserable heart, misericordia. It is to show pity towards the sufferings of the other, whether this suffering is just or unjust. So when we say that God is merciful, this, mean that this means that God suffers for us when we sin. Now I say the word suffering in inverted commas, in square quotes, because this is very dangerous theological territory. God does not suffer in a human sense. Yet, as John Paul II said, the Bible speaks to us of a father who feels compassion for us, as though suffering our pain. In a word, this inscrutable and indescribable fatherly pain will bring abo about, above all, the wonderful economy of redemptive love in Jesus Christ." End quote. So this is my first point, that mercy is God's drawing close to us as we suffer, even when we sin. Secondly, there are two wo Hebrew words for mercy. The first is hesed. This refers to God's fidelity to himself, to God's faithfulness. God has made a covenant with us in the blood of his Son. Even should we be unfaithful, God is always faithful. He is our Father, and we are his children. God will never abandon us in his steadfast love. We can count on God's love. We can count on God's mercy. Thirdly, the other Hebrew word for mercy is rahamim. Rahamim refers to the deepest place of the person. It is synonymous with tenderness. When God sees us suffering, God draws close to us in his tenderness. We see this in the father's response of the return of the prodigal son. God is faith, the father is faithful to his fatherhood. So we see hesed. This is my son who has returned. But then we see rachamim, we see mercy, in the father's running out to meet his son. 
in his tender mercy, God draws near to us when we sin. And then finally, all that I have said above. First, God's mercy is in revealed in his suffering for us when we sin. Second, in God's fidelity. Thirdly, in his drawing near to us. All of this can be summed up in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mercy of God made flesh. He reveals the Father of mercy, and he is that mercy himself. Jesus has revealed that God is love, and that this love, when it sees our suffering, our brokenness, our alienation, this love reveals itself as mercy. God is mercy, which, John Paul II said, is love's second name. It is this mercy incarnate in Jesus Christ that we encounter in the sacrament. And now I will consider how the actions of the penitent in the sacrament, namely contrition, confession and penance, are an encounter with the mercy of the Father that heals us. The Church teaches that there are three actions of the penitent in the sacrament. We should not understand these actions in an external or in a mechanical way. Rather, contrition, confession and penance are taken up into the dramatic turning towards the Father that is expressed in conversion. So the first action is contrition. This is heartfelt sorrow for my sins and the intention to sin no more. Contrition is different from attrition. With attrition, we are sorry for our sins because we fear punishment. This is salutary and it is a gift from God. However, it is imperfect. Contrition is the response of love. We are sorry for our sins not because of fear, but because of our love for God, a love that we have received. As St. John says, we love because God has loved us first. Thus, true contrition is awakened by love. The starting point for reconciliation and healing is my awareness of God's personal and unique love for me as his son or daughter. The second action is confession. Here we have the naming of sins and the taking responsibility for my sins. This can only come about because of my trust and hope in the mercy of God. Through confession, I open my heart to God in order to receive forgiveness. Francis de Sales wrote in prayer, heart speaks to heart. In prayer, our hearts speak to God's heart. Through the sacrament, we speak to God of the dark places that sin has led us. In some way, the confessional becomes an image of the dark place that I enter due to my sin. However, I do not enter there alone. God is waiting for me in this dark place, and his response to my confession is mercy and forgiveness. And then finally, there is the penance or satisfaction. This is our attempt, united to the sufferings of Christ, to make amends for wrongdoing. The Catechism teaches that penance can consist in prayer, works of mercy, service of neighbour, and voluntary self-denial, and that they help configure us to Christ. Through penance, we die to ourselves with Christ, who is the mercy of the Father, but we also rise with him. These here, then, are the acts of the penitent, contrition, confession, and penance, and the Father's merciful response to us is pardon and absolution, complete forgiveness. This is not something mechanical, where we put our sins into a machine, pull the handle, and out pops forgiveness. No, it is personal. God restores us as his sons and daughters. Like the father in the parable, God says, for this is my son. For this my son, my daughter was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So in conclusion, sin alienates us from God, the source of our existence. 
Sin depersonalizes us. Through sin, we become less than we were created to be. The sacrament of reconciliation is a lifting up. It restores our true dignity as sons and daughters of the Father. This restoration of our dignity heals us personally. It heals us in our relationships with God, with the Church, and with each other. Finally, through the personal and relational healing, the goodness of our place in the world is also affirmed. Now, I am aware that one of the briefs of the Order of Malta Lecture Series is to equip lay Catholics to defend our faith. I hope that this talk tonight has gone some way towards assisting you with an understanding of the Sacrament of Reconciliation and how the sacrament is truly healing for a broken world. I do think, however, that we need to be careful in attempting to come up with a silver bullet or a series of rational propositions to defend the Catholic faith. There is certainly a place for defending the faith, and a church has a history of producing brilliant apologists such as St. Paul and St. Justin. Note, however, they all get martyred. If this is your goal, then it doesn't end well for you. Others have suggested that we construct purely secular arguments to, the, to defend the faith. If we remove all faith elements, then perhaps we can establish common ground. I think that this is potentially dangerous, since you end up removing Christ from the discussion. So how do we defend the faith? We defend it by living it. Christians truly living their faith has been the best defense of Christianity since the beginning. Even if we could construct watertight arguments, if we don't live the faith, then Christianity is compromised. There is no substitute for an authentic witness. That's the bad news. The good news is that God has given us the means to live the faith. He has given us the sacraments, especially reconciliation. Encountering the mercy of God in the sacrament, allowing the healing and transformation that comes from the sacrament, is the best defense for our faith. So I'll conclude with two quotes. The first is from Pope Francis, when he was Cardinal Bergoglio. He said, Only someone who has encountered mercy is happy and comfortable with the Lord. I dare to say that the privileged locus of the encounter is the caress of the mercy of Jesus Christ on my sin. The, the surprising, unforeseeable mercy of one who knows me, knows my betrayals and loves me just the same, appreciates me, embraces me, calls me again, hopes in me and expects from me. This is why the Christian conception of morality is a revolution. It is not a never falling down, but an always getting up again. And then lastly from Pope Benedict. Benedict wrote, love is the light, and in the end, the only light that can always illuminate a world grown dim. Love is possible, and we are able to practice it because we are created in the image of God. Benedict then challenges us to experience love, and I would add mercy, love second name. We are challenged to experience this love and mercy, and in this way, to cause the light and healing of God to enter into the world. Thank you. That was Owen Viner with Reconciliation, Healing for a Broken World. This talk was part of the Order of Malta lecture series organised by the Australian Association of the Order of Malta. And for more talks, interviews and shows, visit cradio.org.au.